Okay, it looks like everybody's here. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm Michael McClellan with L3 Levine Electronics and Electrics. Thank you all for joining us today. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. This presentation is in webcast mode, so, so your phones are muted. However, there are buttons, uh, I believe, down the left side of your screen where you can raise your hand or ask questions or enter the chat box. We would love for you to interact with us. Um, please ask questions and interact with us. We're, today, we're very lucky to have Mark Rogers with us. Mark is with LSPEC. And Mark's been around the power quality world a good bit of time. He actually was an LSPEC customer for many years before joining LSPEC. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Mark Rogers. Well, I appreciate that very much, Michael. I uh, appreciate, appreciate everyone having the opportunity and taking the time to, to join us here today. Um, as Michael said, uh, my name is Mark Rogers. I'm Vice President of Engineering over at LSPEC North America. Um, I was a customer for many years. My background is reliability. I worked in the aerospace and, um, industry for many years before um, going into uh, consulting and really diving headfirst into power quality and seeing <clears throat> really uh, diving into exactly what the impacts of power quality are and various different types of uh, industrial different uh, applications and, and how uh, increasing the electrical reliability in a network has uh, what kind of impact that has not only on the equipment and the life expectancies but the overall efficiencies of, of plants and, and um, how that relates to increased uptime, reduced operational costs, reduced maintenance uh, and repair um, costs, and overall efficiency uh, within the production. So oh, let me see if I can make sure I've got this on the right. So obviously uh, over the past 30, 40 years with the uh, advancements of various different types of technologies um, and the integration of those into not only industrial applications, but residential you know, um, and commercial buildings, uh, all of these you know, with the advent of DFDs and motor controls and um, the sensitivity of PLCs um, and sensitivity of equipment throughout the the impact as these are integrated onto the network it's a cumulative effect so what happens in one facility has an impact on the neighboring facilities and and as such in the utility grid as well so uh, as we've in, incorporated more controls and and more features and functionality um, this has an impact on the electrical network, uh, inducing uh, additional harmonics, uh, which induces heat, um, ever-expanding, you know, production uh, increases, so maximi uh, maximizing capacity and, and running into capacity constraints. Um, and really, one of the most uh, significant aspects of it, and one of the things that, that I really focus on, is the impact on... Uh, the voltage on the network and and how how uh, the voltage uh, levels on the network can have an impact throughout the facility. So um, and, and the cumulative effect of all of these different aspects um, can can be quite significant on how a plant operates, how it functions, and may induce uh, some ongoing issues that aren't necessarily attributed to power quality. Um, but oftentimes, once those aspects are compensated for or remediated or minimized, um, a lot of these things seem to kind of disappear or at least are minimized quite significantly. So some of the things that are often seen out, out in the world, uh, some typical electrical issues, um, going to be phantom tripping whether that be of breakers or of motor controls or of soft starts. Um, you're also going to have uh, phantom PLC alarms where things will trip out and it's not really understood exactly what occurred, but um, you have to 
stop the process, restart it, and get it going again. Um, with integration of more and more VFDs, oftentimes we're seeing more and more VFD repair and replacement costs. Um, and secondary impacts oftentimes that aren't attributed to power quality can oftentimes um, be significantly impacted by the, the power quality on that network. Like uh, quite frequently we're seeing in recent years where people will call and um, after having done a, a new LED uh, lighting system upgrade, they're having constant uh, component failures and trying to understand if it's a manufacturing defect or, or what's causing it. And oftentimes it's, it's just the volatility of the network that's actually putting a strain on those components. So not all things that, that might be automatically attributed to power quality um, or things that might not, might not be attributed to power quality, oftentimes power quality is a, a, a leading contributor. So the traditional corrective measures have often been, and I'm sure many of you guys have seen this out in the field, is in order to ensure that things don't trip out, we'll just go and adjust the tap setting on the transformer. Um, because every single time you have one of these large loads that, uh, or a large motor start, that has a, a significant impact on the, the voltage level throughout the network. So in order to keep that, that voltage from dropping too far uh, and having an impact on other systems or processes, um, they'll tap up the transformer. So treating the symptom versus necessarily the cause. Um, modification of motor controls. So, you know, a adding additional limiting factors um, that are kind of acquired over years of experience and understanding that, you know, if we, we lower these, uh, these current settings or, or input settings, then that'll ensure, you know, minimize, um, uh, minimize the, the interruptions. Uh, there's also additional solutions external that might be inline harmonic filtration or isolation transformers, active harmonic filtration systems, and even traditional power factor correction systems. But all of these have uh, an impact on the network as well. Some of them beneficial, some of them not so much. So uh, oftentimes these you know, secondary impacts by, by adjusting the transformer taps up higher, you're running at a, at a higher voltage level during nominal conditions in order to account for the rare occasions when those motors start uh, to minimize the, those voltage sags. So you're, you're operating at a higher, um, at a higher voltage level or a higher pressure level if you're kind of thinking of it as a, uh, an analogy with the compressed air system. Um, you can also, uh, by increasing these voltage levels, you can decrease the equipment life expectancies or increase the harmonic, um, uh, contribution on that network, uh, increasing the heat. Uh, oftentimes, uh, it's easy to allocate heat with life expectancy. With um, If we can reduce the operating temperature by 10 degrees, um, extends the, the life of that component out by 50%, right? Um, so that, that, that holds true with electronics as well. So if we can redu reduce, maintain a steady voltage level and uh, minimize those harmonics and allows the equipment to run in a, in a much um, much more beneficial um, environment so that it can extend the life of those out. Um, so when we're talking about traditional power factor correction, um, and these are what's typically seen out in the field, these are the use of electromechanical contactors in order to account for the reactive load demands. And in general, the purpose is, is just to mitigate for power factor penalties, right? So the, the utility doesn't, um, doesn't look kindly upon a facility that's using uh, or not efficiently using um, the, the energy within the facility. So in order to offset the cost to correct for that on the utility side, they might induce a power factor penalty. So with a traditional system, uh, they work in by switching in groups um, that through the use of this electrical contactor. So it brings in all three phases all at once. And in order to ensure that it doesn't go over capacitive, generally they, they operate with a, a corrective response every 20 to 30 seconds. So you can see here, this is actually a, a, some measurements that were taken um, on a network that had a traditional power factor correction system, and we 
disengage the system for a little over five minutes and then re-engage the system and you can see the impact on this. So without the system engaged, it had a very low uh, voltage level on a 480 volt uh, nominal or a 460 volt nominal. And then as it steps in, whoop, as it brings in each group, you can see it, it rises that voltage level. But any of these um, moments in between here, it can't respond for that. So it can take over two and a half minutes to actually get full load demand response. But if the systems aren't designed properly, it can actually have a negative impact on harmonics. So you can see here with the system engaged, they're running at about a 5.6 THD on their voltage, which is quite high. But with the system off, it's a lower harmonics level because oftentimes these systems aren't designed properly to account for the harmonic spectrum. And if the if it doesn't have any reactors or inductors with uh, internal to it that are tuned, you know, specifically towards the, the harmonic spectrum that is seen on that network, it can actually amplify those harmonics, which just further um, aggravates the, the the wear and tear on equipment. And you can also see that every single time those electromechanical contactors come in, you can see the transients being induced. And those transients are not just there local to that system, but are those propagate throughout the network um, and can have adverse effect on other equipment um, or the process itself. Also, that being said, the capacitors uh, internal to these power correction systems are susceptible, you know, most susceptible to things like voltage levels as well as transients and harmonics. So this is why quite frequently when you go into a, a, a facility that has a traditional power factor correction system, oftentimes they may not be fully functional or functional at all because every single time these transients are hit, they, they put little pinpricks in, uh, in internal to the capacitor insulation and slowly over time, it degrades, and this is why oftentimes you, the uh, there's been instances of fire, uh, units catching on fire because of those uh, contacts, and they have you know moving parts which can um, create issues. So the alternative methodology and, and, and what we employ here at our our solutions integrate at Elspec are um, we utilize a, a pure electronic switching. So all of our systems operate, have no electromechanical uh, parts or contactors. Um, basically, the way the, the system works is it will measure, it will monitor and calculate the full load demand response required on that network in less than a quarter of a cycle. And then it once um, then it will wait for the voltage waveform to actually cross the zero threshold and it will engage each phase as the, the voltage crosses that zero potential. So by doing so, we can switch in as many groups as we need or we can take out as many groups as we need to virtually instantaneously. So our typical full load demand response is less than one cycle. So we, we wait for that, um, we measure and calculate in less than a quarter of a cycle, and then we wait for the voltage waveforms to cross. So by having a complete uh, electronically switched system, um, there's no transients whatsoever, which allows for long life expectancy um, and uh, can have a, a, a really important impact on the voltage levels. And that's really the main benefit and the purpose of, of the equalizer system is by accounting for all of the downstream load demands, we can create a much more stable environment, which uh, can allow for all of the equipment to actually um, function uh, and perform more efficiently. Uh, we stabilize that because we're stabilizing that voltage level to a very, very tight bandwidth, we are basically putting the equipment back into more of a laboratory type condition versus having a very volatile network where there's constant fluctuation of loads that are having an impact on, on the voltage throughout the network and being seen that way. So in looking at just kind of a, a typical um, compressed air analogy, um, 
for those that are not as quite versatile in uh, the electronics world, uh, it's e an easy analogy to kind of share with people is, is how an electrical system compares with a compressed air system. So with a compressed air system, you have pressure and you have flow. So the pressure is what's needed to maintain um, or what is required by all the components within that network to perform as it's designed. And the flow is actually what's providing the work. And the same is holds true when it comes with voltage and, and current. So the voltage is, is the pressure, the electrical pressurization on that network. And the current is actually what uh, helps provide that, the electrical work. Um, and when you have inefficiencies within that flow, like in a compressed air system, if you have a large load coming in and requires a lot of flow um, to perform that function, it's going to drop the pressure um, throughout that network. And the same holds true with electrical systems. When you have a large electrical uh, motor that is starting, that requires a lot of reactive power, uh, magnetizing current to get that motor um, elevated and spinning um, appropriately. And all of the neighboring equipment are going to see those fluctuation changes as well, or see that pressure change or voltage drop. Um, as well, you know, uh, on a compressed air system, you have different inefficiencies, whether that be leak, leaks or um, turbulence within the flow. Same holds true with current. You're going to have harmonics, which is the turbulence within the flow. Um, and the reactive power can, is kind of analogous with some of your leak, leak loads as well. Um, so in order to uh, improve upon a compressed air system, Oftentimes, you might uh, add a demand expansion tank in order to account for those instantaneous pressure drops and maintain a, a more stable pressure on the network. That's, in essence, what an equalizer does. So it provides that instantaneous load, uh, load demand response to allow for that pressure to be, uh, that voltage to be stabilized on that network. The I guess we'll stop for a poll question real quick. Uh, Michael, if you want to go ahead and throw that up there for um, maybe some of the things that you've experienced. Okay, the poll question is now open. We'd love some participation from our audience to let us know what types of experiences you guys have had with your electrical distribution systems. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna close the poll and we'll share the results for about 10 seconds. It looks like quite a few of you have premature VFD failures due to poor power factor or harmonics or varying voltages. Thank you for your yeah. participation. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of that, um, uh, especially over the past several years. And I think it, there's been an opportunity in that <clears throat> It's uh, quite frequently in the past, it was, um, I, I learned from the very, in the very beginning, you don't ask people if they have power quality problems because if the lights are on and the motors are spinning in the right direction, things are good. Um, but I think as, as we have progressed, people have started to understand that, um, you know, the VFDs, uh, the VFDs, you know, uh, failure or repair or replacement cost has become quite significant. And if um, we, we've had some tremendous impact on actually improving that, uh, and we'll, we'll show some of that here in the uh, in the next few slides. Oh, I'm gonna get these controls down here. So, how about Michael? Why don't we? It's, sometimes it's better to um, seeing it uh, seeing it in motion versus um, talking about it. So, Michael, if you want to. Um, play the video on your end, maybe that'll work a little bit better.
HealthSpec is active in various industries using its equalizer, a real-time thyristor switched capacitor system. In plastic plants, molding machines are fed by a single transformer, resulting in fast changes in reactive energy demand and voltage fluctuation. The LSPEC equalizer system compensates in real time any demand of reactive energy. The results? Voltage stabilization and power supply enhancement. During production of wire mesh, current consumption may reach thousands of amperes repeatedly. This mode of operation reduces the mesh quality and increases the flicker level beyond the permitted range. The LSPEC equalizer system reduces the voltage drops and substantially improves the flicker level and production quality. LSPEC has supplied the equalizer systems for most of the car manufacturers around the world. The equalizer system is mainly used in the welding shop where the current consumption changes extremely fast due to a large number of welders. The equalizer compensates within a less than one cycle any demand of reactive energy, resulting in stable voltage. Thanks to the LSPEC equalizer system, production quality has been improved, saving time and money in the quality control process. LSPEC supplies the equalizer systems for many crane applications in seaports worldwide. In locations such as Santos Port in Brazil, the equalizer system was installed in a control room located on the top of the crane. When lifting a container, the consumption of power and reactive energy increases and the voltage drops. With the equalizer system in place, the voltage drop was eliminated and the lifting capacity was improved by 20 to 30%. A national water supply company chose Elspec to supply a motor startup solution for a large pumping facility. The facility included four motors of 11 kV, 3500 HP each, connected through a transformer to the facility 22 kV supply. A motor starts up is demonstrated during a period of a few seconds. The EQST equalizer controller connects all groups immediately and disconnected the group step by step at the end of the startup. The voltage drop at substation was improved from 10% to 2.4%. The current was reduced by 44% and the startup period from 4 seconds to 3 seconds. Spec when power meets quality. Very nice. Well, I appreciate that, Michael. Um, so sometimes it's, as I said, sometimes it's easier to, to see uh, than it is to talk about it. But one of the things you'll notice in, in, in that video is it, it's actually showing you the controller screen and it's uh, we're trying to highlight up in the top left corner. Those are actually the groups that are coming in as demand, as needed. So we can go from zero kVAR to 100 megavar in less than a network cycle, and we can bring it all out in less than a network cycle. So the the true benefit of that is really the um, the voltage stabilization that's that's induced. So we're we're basically mitigating for all of the downstream load demands and and solidifying and stable and creating a lot more strength and stability on that network when it comes to voltage. So, and, and there's a lot of uh, secondary impacts as well. So we also help not only raise the voltage level, um, basically to equal what the secondary out, uh, the secondary output of the, of the supply trans transformer is um, and maintain it in that, um, in a very, very tight, range, but we also help better balance those loads, which can have uh, an impact on your efficiency, the equipment efficiency rate and heat being induced, things of that nature as well. So in this this chart right here, this was actually, um, this was on a, a compressed air, uh, on an electrical network that supplied, I think it was about 10 large air compressors. All of them were cross-line starters. And when we first did the baseline measurements, they were actually running um, during nominal load. Uh, they were running at about 495 um, because whenever one of those air compressors um, came online, it would drop that voltage to about 465, 470. 
So they wanted to make sure that it wasn't that it didn't trip anything out on the network. So the the main purpose of of this facility, they were trying to maximize their um, their energy efficiency. So while I was actually looking at um, on his system and looking at the data as he was at the, the unit. And we just did some system tests and turned the system off uh, under its standard balance configuration. And then just with our system, you could actually tweak um, the controller to, to do, uh, to perform. It's got a lot of flexibility on how you tell it to perform. It's not just an on off kind of functionality. You can tell it to base the compensation on the average of all three legs, which is this is um, at the beginning of this, or you can tell it to um, just compensate based on the average of only two of those three or just based on one. Um, and you can see that when we had the system disengaged, there was a significant amount of imbalance that was incurred. Um, so I had them kind of tweak some of the controller settings and we actually raised the voltage even higher, um, but by just in better improving the balance even further, we we're actually able to get a better efficiency rating on their network. So, um, which is just another benefit. Um, I'm not getting these controls accurate. <laughs> um, and, and we can also do these for medium voltage uh, networks as well. So we just utilize a step up transformer. Step up transformer. We can design the system at 600 or six, uh, 690 volt and then step that up to whatever levels necessary. So whether that's 4160 or uh, even at the utility sector as well in order to better stabilize the, um, the utility network. You can see here, this is actually um, a large uh, food processing facility on their, they had 16 large ammonia air compressors. Um, uh, for their chiller operations. And when, when we zoomed in, we could actually see that each one of those was actually four individual starts. And you can see that they were running a little bit high on a 4160 network in order to account for those voltage drops uh, being induced. And all of this was, was primarily attributed to the reactive uh, power demand required and getting those motors started. So when we initially started, uh, the client at, um, is an old utility guy and, and said, um, you know, we'll just set the target at 87% power factor. Um, so we went ahead and did that as he requested and took some data and then I went ahead and told him, you know, go ahead and set it up to 98%, leave it overnight, come back, pull the data, and then we can just show him because he was just leaving things on the table. Um, so you can see here, we actually metered upstream of that location at the same time um, and so what I did was actually showed some of the baseline measurements before, as well as, uh, with the system engaged. So you can kind of see that even on the 13.8 line, there was a huge impact on those motor starts before the, the system was engaged. But after the system was engaged, it was a, a very steady state, um, opportunity. And you can see that we're maintaining this voltage level, very, very high, um, very high tolerance. And this sag is actually less than two cycles long, um, which is the uh, the maximum time required for the system for a full load demand response. So you can see here when we set it at 98%, it had an even greater uh, voltage stability. Um, this allows actually for the opportunity to adjust your taps and actually step things back down so that they operate where they um, where the equipment was, de was designed for. So by minimizing the current as well and then optimizing the voltage levels can allow for um, much less heat uh, being uh, generated on the network, which uh, as well as harmonics, which can extend equipment asset life out um, quite significantly. Uh, this has a, a, a particular impact on VFDs on our network. So one of the things that we've oftentimes Seen um, is after um, stabilizing the voltage on the network throughout, we oftentimes see uh, have clients that have a you know 50 to 80 percent reduction in their VFD repair and replacement costs, and the reason for that is that 
With a VFE, if a VFE is trying to maintain a constant speed or a constant torque, but the the supply voltage that it, it's being fed from on that circuit has other loads that are constantly coming in and out or inducing harmonics, the the VFE has to have a response. So if there's a drop in voltage, there has to be a, a responding increase in amperage in order to account for that. Well, once we've stabilized that network, now all of a sudden the equipment can perform as designed without having to constantly um, uh, react to the, the voltage on the network uh, variability being induced. This also holds true for um, applications that um, utilize cogen or if they are generator uh, uh, generator powered. Um, they're all generator manufacturers that pretty explicitly state that you cannot run a power factor correction system um, on uh, a generator network uh, because they don't want the system to be overcapacitive because that actually induces additional heat and wear and tear on the generator. That is with the exclusion of us. So we we worked with Cummings and Caterpillar and you know all the, uh, the the major name manufacturers because our system responds so quickly. Um, it's actually the only system that's uh, allowed to be utilized on those networks, and it can have a really significant impact on their efficiency rate. So we have um, many customers in the uh, Caribbean and, um, and island networks that uh, Fiji Water is a very good example. They they have about 38 equalizers throughout the Fiji Water uh, plant in Fiji. And they won't add they they won't add an additional production line without a system on it because they had um, such a dramatic impact on their fuel efficiency being significantly improved um, as well as their generator maintenance and repair costs were drastically reduced um, because we basically put um, we've allowed the generator to work and and perform what its um, its purpose is and not be influenced by all the loads um, on that network. So um, let me kind of go through here. This is a, a, an example of a failed motor start on a generator network, and you can see that uh, the generators have uh, uh, AVRs, which is um, automatic voltage regulation, but oftentimes uh, they're very slow in response. So by the time the AVR responds, it's actually after the event is already over. So you can see these large voltage uh, surges um, because the uh, AVR is responding after the event is actually over with. So with the equalizer in place, we basically remove all the load off the AVR because the equalizer is actually providing the voltage stabilization. Um, and uh, again, here's another example of the, the high fluctuation due to the AVR not being able to, to respond in a short enough time period. This is a common uh, common uh, chart in, in the generator world with a steady state alternator reactive power capability curve. You can see with this one plant that <clears throat> with all of the uh, the events you know within the measurement period with the system disengaged, they could never really get into that acceptable region and they were constantly having equipment issues and uh, VFE repairs and uh, generator repair requirements. After we actually installed the system, it never could get out of that. Um, so it allows for a much more stable environment and you can actually hear it. So as soon as you actually turn the system on, um, you can actually hear the generator and the AVR quiet down by as much as 18 decibels um, because you're allowing it to do uh, perform in a, in a much more stable environment. Welding is another uh, amazing uh, application for us. We we have both balance systems and unbalanced systems. So we have uh, balance systems are where we treat all three phases equally, uh, and that's a majority of loads uh, or a majority of applications out in the industrial world. Uh, but we also have unbalanced system where we take each individual phase independently, um, and this you know for welding is is oftentimes a requirement. So you can see here with the system disengaged that we're having these large voltage sags on these two phases. 
um, with a, a peak current of about 1800 amps. Um, whereas once we engage the system, we raise that voltage level and then we minimize this voltage shag to about two or three volts. Um, this uh, has a resulting uh, uh, an effect on the peak currents. So once again, you can see that by reducing these peak currents by about 700 amps, this has a, a significant impact on extending the life of the welding tips out. It actually increases the quality of the welds. Um, in this particular place, case, it reduced their rework requirements on welds by over 23% um, and extended the life of the welding tips by 33%. So um, real big impact. And it also mitigates work uh, quite well known in the automotive industry for the welding app, uh, application because oftentimes the, the welding processes and the voltage instability and the unbalance that are being induced by that can have a significant impact on other areas of the plant, whether that be stamping or the paint shop, things of that nature. So we're basically mitigating all of the, the impact of, of, of the treated area from the rest of the network. Metal stamping is another uh, good application, lumber, lumber mills as well. Um, anything that's very dynamic in nature, you can kind of see here in this one application where they're already running at a somewhat low nominal voltage level, about 460 volts. And then uh, after we uh, engage the system, we've raised that voltage and then maintained it in a very, very steady state um, and allowing for uh, the compensation kind of showing you here are the voltage levels here on a statistical view. So this is the 90 percentile zone. So you can see that there was a wide range in the baseline measurements going anywhere from 419 to 468 versus, um, you know, the 90 percentile zone in here, it's, a, it's about a three or four volt range. So we just keep it in a real, real tight, uh, tight uh, tolerance area. And once again, on the peak currents, this is all relates to heat. Right by reducing by stabilizing that voltage, it doesn't require as much current um, to perform its function. So uh, a lot less heat is then induced on that network, which heat leads to to wear and tear. Right, and this is probably one of my favorite uh, charts here because we can superimpose the before and after on top of each other. So you can see the the nominal uh, the average nominal level uh, rising. Uh, and then as in mean, the baseline measurements, as the, the active power in the purple, as the system engage, you can see this very jagged uh, aspect to the, the active power. And this jagged uh, profile right here is a response in, in, to the voltage drop. So as the voltage drops, each motor is gonna have a different torque to kilowatt ratio. So when that voltage drops, it, it's constantly chasing that voltage and trying to get it um, to respond in the way that it needs to for the process. Whereas when the system is get engaged, we've now reduced that to about three volts and there's just a smooth transition up. Um, and you can also see this in this process, um, as soon as the, the, the stamping motion is uh, completed, it can move on to the next one. So you can see this leftward shift here from the purple to the green. That's actually showing you how the equipment is actually able to function and perform better. Much like what we saw in the video on startup conditions, we can, uh, the equalizer system can actually replace the need of, of soft starts on a network. Um, because if, if the only purpose of that soft start is to minimize that voltage drop or the duration of that voltage drop, um, and it's not process, it's not required by the process, then the equalizer is is uh, is actually the one that's providing that voltage stability. So it's not the soft start may not be required. So in that one video uh, at, towards the end, it actually showed where a single equalizer system was designed and utilized as the soft start for uh, four medium voltage water pumps. So instead of having to to purchase four uh, medium voltage soft starts or four uh, medium voltage VFDs, now they can just have one equalizer system that performs that functionality. Um, and also you can see here the in the the differences 
of the areas underneath these curves is actually your TWH savings. So you can actually see uh, the process improvement. And it actually imp uh, increased their production rate. So in the, this, this, in this chart, it's very easy to see um, that the number of time required to do 25 stamps versus 25 stamps with the system off, um, we increased their production rate by about uh, a little over 9%. So quite significant uh, results in this. You know, seeing the the current, the peak current drop by 28%, the production improved by about 9%. All the while, the energy consumption was reduced by uh, over 12%. So um, some very very good impacts on this. Um, we can kind of go through this one as well. Do, do we want to uh, do another poll question, Michael? Sure, let's see what we have here. The poll question that's currently open is, what are the most common driving factors for your electrical energy improvement Yeah, it's all, it's always a, a good idea to to understand you know the the purpose behind a lot of these projects because um, you know that that oftentimes it's it's if it's a cost reduction measure or an efficiency improvement measure or if it's just to get rid of power factor penalties um, you know all these are important. But if you can also get a, a lot of the benefits associated um, with power factor correction, but also have voltage stabilization, harmonic mitigation, things of that nature, there's a, a lot higher, uh, a, lot, uh, a lot better end results that can be achieved. Um, here, we'll, this is a, a good example uh, of one of those. Uh, types of applications. So um, we had uh, years ago gotten a request from a very large uh, food processing refinery that they just wanted to improve their power factor. So we have a few different um, models of our system, which uh, the, the equalizer is, is where we started and that, that has um, the, the fast response of um, less than, a, you know, typically less than one network cycle. But also uh, understanding that you know, there's to be competitive in some applications where the, the client may either have very steady, stable loads um, and not have you know very much dynamic nature to uh, to their processes, or if they're just looking to get rid of power factor penalties. We also have uh, uh, another model called our ActiveR, which is the same exact internal components. Um, there's no differentiation uh, in performance or functionality with this, with the uh, small exception of the total response time. So the active R uh, is more comparative to a traditional capacitor bank system, but um, with much better re response time. So instead of having a single step response every 20, 30 seconds, we actually can do full load demand response. And typically, it's between one to two seconds um, with a maximum time of three to four seconds. Um, so the, the benefit of that is that <clears throat> if any time in the future you determine that you actually need faster response, it's basically you can upgrade the, the, the controller and it now has the full response of an equalizer as well. So in this case, this uh, manufacturer called us and said they knew exactly what they wanted, the size, uh, the response rate. So we provided that to them. Uh, came back, uh, they were very happy with the results. Came back um, a couple of years later when I got involved and we started looking at some of their data and you know, kind of came to the determination that you know, if we just made these a little bit bigger and if we made them uh, respond quicker, we could actually create the voltage stabilization on the network that would have a much better impact uh, on the facility. So we got that uh, approved, uh, which is another benefit of our systems is that you can 
add additional capacity to it or you can modify how it works and how it functions um, versus traditional systems where once you got what you have is what you got right so once we actually increase the capacity and um, uh, increase the response time up to an equalizer you can see the the market difference so they're running about 467 or so uh, on their voltage as soon as we turn on the system went straight up to about 498 uh, or 489 I'm sorry and you can see the significant impact on the current one of the things we notice here is that um, after so many minutes the current went back up and um, we started looking at uh, over the next couple of uh, about the next week to two weeks we started to see that their production rate went up by about 10 percent and then uh, just just with inclusion of you know increased capacity and making it the equal uh, the, into the fast response time of the equalizer um, then I got a call from him a couple months later said he had a real big problem and I was so I drove up there and asked him what the problem was and he said well remember how we increased production by about 10 percent yeah as well now they're up to 25 percent improvement and we got a problem because we don't know why it's over we're, we're now producing over the engineered max of this facility and the other problem is now they want 35 percent right so so we actually started doing some real uh, deep diving into it and started asking around and seeing you know what had changed and we finally got a hold of the controls guy and we said hey you know how have things been running this all better than it ever has I said, okay what, what, what have you been doing? He goes, oh, I've just been removing all the uh, limiting factors in PLC. He goes, we don't trip anything out anymore. So we don't need any limiting factors. So he's, they just started letting everything run out full bore. Um, and they also noticed that, you know, they could actually look at some of individual motors, like this one 300 horsepower motor that was on a VFD. The VFD was really only there for startup conditions. Um, but they realized that they could maintain that same rate and reduce the speed of, on that motor from 60 hertz to 50 hertz. That was about $100,000 in just electrical savings right there. Um, and I've also kind of downplayed this a little bit. They, they're, they're VFDs and electric uh, motor repair um, and replacement costs. For VFDs, they actually, it, it was over a 70% reduction. And on their motor repair and replacement costs, that went down by about 60%. So um, all of these just had a significant impact on the overall production rate and efficiency and costs of that facility. Um, it instantaneously became the most profitable and the highest producing plant uh, throughout the entire organization. Um, and there, since then, we've been doing mass implementation at all their facilities because they just see tremendous impact um, once once they realized it, was, it wasn't about power factor, it's about the voltage on the network. And it just so happens that a consequence of our system is you're gonna have unity power factor all the time, kind of a side effect. Um, now, this is a good thing, even when it comes to some um, facilities that uh, maybe don't have, uh, or, or aren't currently being charged a power factor penalty, um, we have some facilities that once we actually started digging down into it, they weren't being charged a power factor penalty, but you actually get a credit the closer you get to Unity. So just by actually replacing some of their um, old traditional uh, cap bank systems with functional systems that um, they were actually able to get additional credits that more than paid for the system itself. So. Um, very, very, you know, it, obviously every single facility is unique, but we love to take a look and see exactly, you know, it, all the unique conditions within a facility and see what actually might be the best, um, best alternatives for improving that electrical reliability on the facility. This was another one, and, and we can just kind of briefly go over this uh, quickly because I think we're starting to get towards the end of the time. Um, there was a, a, a lumber mill uh, that and that their utility actually had a incentive program that they wanted to 
have this included within. So uh, the utility company hired a external uh, independent engineering firm to do uh, independent analysis, and we did extensive regression analysis. To, uh, and when I say extensive, I, it, it was about four weeks of staring at spreadsheets and doing regression analysis. But you know, looking at the diameter of every log coming in, the moisture content, uh, the the amount of chips that were being produced, uh, the moisture contents of those chips, uh, the SKUs being generated, if environmental conditions were a factor. And basically, after looking at all of that information and then accounting for production, you know, they saw even on their static processes, which is their kiln. And if you know much about uh, the lumber industry, the kiln is basically just, it was probably about 80 to 100 VFD fans all running at the same speed nonstop. You know, nothing ever changes. It's a very, very static process. And then you had, you know, the other, the sawmill, which is very dynamic, and you can see uh, even in the, the main sawmill, they saw about 11 and a half per, uh, percent uh, KW uh, improvement or efficiency improvement. They even there there was another area that that they did a compressed air system upgrade at the same time, so it's it, it was impossible to actually look at a, a pre versus post uh, for this type of condition. So. We, we actually think that we got a little bit more than that, but we were able to just kind of uh, move on from that. <laughs> it was a lot easier just to take out the compressed air savings. Um, but we also got savings associated with some untreated areas because when the plant was uh, prior to the pr uh, project implementation, when the plant was running, their average voltage was around 470, but when the plant was not in operation, their voltage was about 510 because they had tapped up, they had to tap up um, their their voltage in order to make sure that whenever those logs come in and, and jam up, that it doesn't trip a bunch of things out. So this was seen everywhere. And the easiest thing to show for comparative purposes is that kiln because you can see with a baseline, because it's a steady state process, you can see that baseline, you could tell when the, the sawmill was not engaged or was not running versus when the sawmill was running because you can see the impact on the voltage levels and also how that has an impact on the current levels as well. After we installed the equalizers, we were able to actually tap down all of the transformers on the facility by three levels. So now we just maintain the steady voltage level and we lowered the current even further. Now this le this this circuit or this network here was already running at a 0.90 power factor. And because of its steady state, it only needed an active bar. So now we got it up to 0.985 for the uh, power factor. But you can look at the KW with the average of 985 versus 935 uh, once it was treated, as well as the KVA. So we have we can have a significant impact on KVA reduction. This is uh, particularly important in a lot of uh, uh, instances now where we have uh, perhaps some production um, uh, or uh, production capabilities that are overseas where it's harder logistically to get it over here. We have several plants that are trying to add a lot more production lines uh, to existing facilities to make up for that uh, demand. And Sometimes the utility just doesn't have any more capacity or the utility has capacity, but the facility doesn't. So they'd have to add a whole new transformer. Well, oftentimes, instead of having to add a new service or a new transformer, which could cost three, three and a half million dollars, um, like we've had several projects lately where they either had to add a new transformer, which is three, three and a half million, or they can install, you know, several small units all throughout the facility to minimize, to optimize their capacity uh, being used. And instead they installed 10 systems for $350,000 all said and done, and they had more than enough capacity uh, without having to add additional um, capability on their, on their either service interests or new transformer. So that can be a, a huge uh, cost savings or, um, 
cost avoidance uh, measure that can be beneficial. But was what was more uh, impactful to the operation was actually the impact that it had on production. So at this facility, they they pretty much had an electrician per shift that their, their main purpose was just to go around resetting uh, breakers or resetting VFDs because they were constantly having things trip out. And they'd, they'd have phantom alarms that they couldn't quite figure out. They'd have to stop the process, reset it, get it going again. And they'd have at least one VFD failure per week, and they just really hoped it wasn't an important one. Um, once we put in these systems and we tap, you know, we we're able to optimize that voltage level and keep a steady state condition, all of their nuisance tripping basically went away. Um, the phantom PLC alarms that they have never associated with power quality, they just went away. And you know, their VFD repair uh, failures went down dramatically. Now, obviously, you're still going to have some pre-existing conditions, but that's why we like to look at it over time because you can see that after those, you know, pre-existing conditions have worked out, all of a sudden, you know, it just precipitously falls each year. Um, and that, you know, produce their unplanned downtime by 23%. Um, you know, their specific KPI metrics that they were looking at was cost per 1,000 footboards. They always used to be dead last out of all of the facilities within their organization. The very next month, as soon as, you know, after implementation of the project, they were third in the entire organization of, I think it's over 30 different mills. So um, just huge, it can have a really big impact on the overall reliability that oftentimes even reliability engineers don't, don't often think about um, is the impact that the power quality can have on equipment uh, life and functionality. So with that, I guess I can kind of open it up for questions. If anybody has um, any comments or questions, we'd be happy to, to answer those. That's a great job, Mark. Thank you so much. Um, as always, great job. We do have a couple of questions. For one of the first questions that rolled in is, what are the highest voltage and highest KVAR compensation available? Well, that's a great question. Um, it's really the sky's the limit. <clears throat> um, I think our largest system that we have is in the world is, uh, there is a huge uh, wind farm in Australia. And I think, I think there's about a, over a hundred megabar and um, for voltage, it really doesn't, we don't really have a top end now. And, and the reason for that is because we do, um, our systems are, the, our systems internal are low voltage. So we can, uh, design the systems for direct connect anywhere up to 690 volts. So for medium voltage application or, or even a high voltage application, we just design it at that 600 or 690 volts range and then utilize a step-up transformer and to step it up to whatever voltage is necessary. So that could be, you know, um, that could be 13.8, that could be 41.60, that could be 100, you know, 120 kilovolts. It's, it's really the sky's the limit because KVAR is KVAR at any point. So we just step it up to whatever the voltage network needs to be. Um, we can also utilize this not only for um, load demand response, but we can actually, we, we have specific units that are designed for wind energy and we've got some that have, uh, that are, the controller functionality is, uh, you know, geared towards generator applications, but even like uh, what's a lot more interest in lately is in solar applications where uh, for a new solar installation, you know, the utility doesn't want the solar uh, generator just to provide straight KW. They want it uh, to be on demand to supply power at either 0.5 inductive to anywhere to 0.95 capacitive. So instead of having inverters convert the KW um, to account for whatever the utility demand is, we can actually have our system that provides all the reactive power and can be on demand change and now utilize cheaper inverters to just convert the KW to KW. 
uh, from DC to AC and then allow the system to provide the reactive power as, as needed. So there's there's a myriad of different possibilities when it comes to medium voltage and high, high voltage applications. Great, Mark. That's a um, great response. Uh, we are dealing with a customer right now who is saving his uh, client uh, probably around a million dollars because uh, our uh, equalizer system can do uh, some power factor correction and has there's a lot of guidelines that the in the power purchase agreement between a solar utility generator and uh, Georgia Power or the Southern Company, and usually they require that you be able to provide full load between 0.95 lagging and 0.95 leading power factor. And if you can't, then they're they were reserve the right to modify your power purchase uh, agreement, uh, of course, downward. So um, LSPEC has been able to save that customer from having to buy uh, additional inverters, which is the uh, only other way to get the needed capacity to satisfy the power purchase agreement. Yeah, and it's it's really beneficial if we can um, to get in on the design phase because just like what Michael said, instead of having to purchase much more expensive inverters that have a wider range of capabilities, you can get a much cheaper inverter that <clears throat> is. A, you know, basically just there to invert DC to AC and KW to KW saves a lot of money. And um, and it actually increases their production rate. So we had one, a small uh, military base that was adding, um, was adding a, a small solar plant to, to help uh, supplement their power needs. And instead of utilizing inverter to correspond, you know, to be able to provide some of that reactive power and convert, you know, up to 10% of that KW for that purpose. Now they can just generate as much KW as possible and allow the reactive component to be taken care of, in essence, free of charge uh, with the equalizer systems. And it's, it's an increase in production rate as well in that regard. Okay, great. We had um, we had another question here. How long was the response time without your device on the system? I see that with your device, it gets reduced down to two cycles. Yeah. So the um, as I said before, with the equalizer system, it it measures and, and calculates it, the the response required in less than a quarter of a network cycle, and then it kind of depends on where the voltage waveform is at that point. Um, but it waits for phase one to reach that zero potential, and then it brings in that, and then it does the same for phase two and for phase three. So the total response for all three phases coming in is less than it's a maximum of two network cycles. So <clears throat> although you will see it on, so the first product we ever, uh, the, the way that our company was actually founded is actually on the equalizer system. And we subsequently, in order to prove that how fast it actually was uh, responding, that's actually how um, our metering product line came about. So we have, it was the first, first in the world continuous waveform recording meter so that we just sample 1,024 samples per cycle per channel constantly. And so on a typical meter, you might not ever see that two 
uh, two cycle uh, sag. But for most equipment, the equipment, uh, uh, most, most equipment doesn't really see anything less than that, you know, four cycles or less. Um, it, it basically just keeps on ticking because of how, um, you know, the internal components of that can respond to instantaneous uh, changes. So uh, with the equalizer, it's a maximum total load response uh, of less than two cycles. Does that make sense? Is that answering the question? We also have the we also have the active bar, like I said before. It has a, a typical full load demand response in one to two seconds. So a lot better than a traditional power factor correction system. And then we have one actually that we created a couple of years ago, which is kind of in between. Uh, it's called Active R Plus. And that has a full load demand response in four to five network cycles. So as long as um, all of, of the big loads um, already are utilizing soft starts or VFEs, then the Active R Plus will provide that voltage stabilization that's required. But if you have any large direct online motor starts, that's really a, a, an equalizer is needed to provide that voltage stabilization. Great, Mark. Uh, and just so everybody knows, there is a poll open. Uh, please rate Mark on his uh, presentation and likability or looks. <laughs> Here's uh, our final question. Can you use open delta step up transformer configuration to read voltage into the equalizer? So I'm assuming this is he's asking about the possibility of using this on a medium voltage system and he wants to use open delta PTs to get the voltage to your controller. Well, the voltage is actually taken um, by the connection feeders. So um, that's where we're getting our, our PT measurements in, uh, is actually through the feeder connections to the cabinet. Um, this, our system itself is actually connected internally in Delta, but we can connect to Y, obviously. Um, and for a medium voltage system, we recommend using um, a delta to delta transformer to step it down to that 690 or 600 volt um, wh where you know where it's at all possible so that there's no phase shift that's induced but we can also account for that phase shift into in internal to our controller as well to uh, if that's if, if that's something that's required so um, and then the only other signals that are actually being brought into the system other than the feeder connection uh, to the network is <clears throat> actually a set of network CTs. So we read the current uh, load demand um, through network CTs that are brought in. That in conjunction with the voltage signal is how we cal calculate the uh, compensation. Great. Um, there is another question here. Um, how much cooling do these units require and what ambient temperatures will they withstand? That's a great question. So we manufacture um, everything that, that we provide. We actually, you actually may have seen some of our systems, just maybe not with our name. Uh, we private label these for a lot of the big name manufacturers. Um, and we've got these, we can, we make our own enclosures as well. So we can do NEMA 1, NEMA 3R, we can do NEMA 4. Um, we can put them in some pretty hostile environments um, as it relates to, you know, caustic. We can coat the internal materials. Um, they do generate some heat, but um, they are very resilient. Um, we can actually put these outside in NEMA 3R enclosures. We've got them in, you know, Georgia outside. We've got them in Arkansas, uh, the Mojave Desert of, of California. If, 
In most applications, it's uh, completely fine. We just ask that you get direct sun off of it, especially like afternoon sun, just to kind of remove that additional radiant barrier uh, or radiant energy. Um, but the, these can quite effectively go out, uh, outside um, very effectively. Another thing that we do that's a little bit different is we have a, a, a functionality in our controller uh, it's called scan mode, where if, <clears throat> say you have a steady state load and you have, you know, five groups that are engaged, instead of just leaving those five groups engaged at all times until there's a load change that requires, you know, either engaging or disengaging groups, instead of just leaving those all engaged, we actually, and because we switch, um, you know, transient free, we'll actually rotate those groups um, so that we're not putting all the load on specific groups constantly. We're kind of rotating the utilization, even in steady state conditions, so that it kind of helps disperse that heat. So often, you know, we take all of these things into consideration when we're, you know, looking at data or we're helping design um, a system is, you know, Oftentimes, I want to leave a couple of groups extra um, on steady state kind of loading, just so it allows for that heat to be dissipated throughout the groups rather than just staying on. Um, but if they're if these systems are indoors, they will they will generate some heat, and there's some there's some calculations associated with that. But it's not you know just based on the system size; it's more of the the KVAR utilization, right? So if, um, if it's designed for motor starts, you know, it may, the system may only be, be utilized at 20, 30% during most conditions so that when those motor starts, it has the capacity to do the rest. So you, you want to take all that into consideration when looking at the heat generation and, and how to handle that. Wonderful. Uh, Mark, as always, wonderful job. Thank you so much to all of the attendees and especially those who participated. Those uh, were some great questions. Hope you'll join us for our next webinar. Everyone have a wonderful day.